Hi, welcome to our part two segment on neoclassicism and romanticism in the early 19th century. We are looking at a painting done by the artist um, Francisco Goya. Um, he became um, the court painter to um, Charles IV of Spain. Um, he is very much inspired by um, Baroque artists such as Velazquez and Rembrandt, and hopefully when you look at this um, picture depicting the royal family, you might think of another Spanish Baroque artist who also depicted the Spanish royal family, and we will in fact um, compare and contrast those. Um, the court of um, Charles IV was notorious for corruption and repression. And so when we look at Goya's painting uh, of the royal family, it is going to be very different um, than Velazquez's interpretation that we saw in Las uh, Minanas. Um, and in some ways, while uh, Goya is characterized more as um, uh, in the movement of Romanticism, in a lot of ways his work um, is kind of in his own category. Um, and we'll talk about um, some of those ideas as well. So when we look in closer detail um, at the composition of the painting, um, some things that you might notice right off the bat is, and hopefully you do notice this, I did, that the portraits um, are not very flattering. Um, when we look at the, the king over here, he kind of has this sort of stout face. Um, he has this barrage of these sort of metals um, pinned on, on his coat, and he kind of looks piggish. Um, the metals are implying that perhaps um, um, Charles IV did not lead with noble values of justice, but was attracted to shiny things. So this was sort of a social commentary on the part of Goya. Um, the other members of the royal family are not idealized either, and their individual, individual portraits are more than unflattering. Um, some critics think that um, Goya was suggesting um, this idea of inbreeding um, within the monarchy. Again, another um, social criticism on the part of Goya. When you look really close at the faces, um, they really are quite unflattering and um, he does sort of make them appear um, a bit um, maybe stupid looking. And, and critics have marveled at perhaps the stupidity of the royal family for not realizing how blatantly Goya was um, exposing their sort of pompous arrogance. So here is um, a comparison um, to um, the artist Velazquez's um, Las Meninas. And his painting was a homage um, to, to Velazquez. Um, it's, it's different and similar. Um, like his predecessor, he places himself um, to the left behind a canvas. Um, however, um, he places the painting he's working on um, behind um, the sort of the oblivious royal family. Where here, it's, it's definitely sort of more in our space. Um, you know, definitely some differences too. You know, the, the royal family is more posed and sort of, you know, in this sort of formal, in these formal positions where here um, the court is is much more relaxed and, and they're sort of in these action poses. Um, and obviously too, again, the, I think people, the faces are more idealized um, in Velazquez's interpretation. Um, than um, the family members of um, Charles IV. Let's look at some other differences too. Um, and, and some critics think that also his placement of um, the painting, you know, between him and the royal family serves as a barrier, um, you know, where he sort of isolates himself from the monarchy. So in, in some respects it's it's similar but also very different than Velazquez's painting where and I'll go back to it you know in a, in a lot of senses Velazquez was very proud um, to be the court painter um, and he really sought um, the admiration and the approval of the king you know here you have the the key bearer 
who would unlock the door for the king, which some critics thought um, was a way for Velasquez to kind of show off his status and that the king was nearby. So, you know, very, very different um, interpretations um, and feelings about um, how each artist felt about the ruling monarchy um, during their time. And like Velasquez, um, Goya is, is a colorito artist um, whose brushwork is loose uh, and um, very expressive. So here you can see detail. Um, and, and again, here's the, the larger composition. So very different than the smooth, sort of immaculate or sort of enamel-like surface of um, some of the neoclassical paintings that we looked at, in particular by um, David. And um, Andres's um, La um, Odalesque, um, the harem girl. We're going to look at some other um, works by Goya. Um, this, um, in addition to being an incredible painter, um, Goya was also a master graphic artist. Um, and he created a, an Aquatint um, series. And I'll talk a little bit more about Aquatint. It's a, it's a type of printmaking. Um, it, it was a series called The Disasters of War from 1810 to 1820. Um, the 82 images added to the visual um, protest against the French occupation of Spain um, by Napoleon Bonaparte. The French emperor had seized control of the country in 1807 after he tricked the king of Spain, um, Charles IV, in allowing Napoleon's troops to pass its border under the pretext of helping Charles invade Portugal. He did not. Instead, he usurped the throne and installed his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, as ruler of Spain. Soon a bloody uprising occurred in which countless Spaniards were slaughtered in Spain cities and countrysides. Although Spain eventually expelled the French in 1814 following the Peninsula War in 1807 through 1814, the military conflict was a long and gruesome ordeal for both nations. Throughout the entire time, Goya worked as a court artist for Joseph Bonaparte, though he would later deny any involvement with the French intruder king. So when we look at the composition, we see that there's a man blindfolded, his head um, cast downwards, and he stands bound to a wooden pole. His white clothes, despite tears and rips, seem to admit a sort of light. Although the man's off-kilter posture signifies defeat, he is still portrayed as heroic, um, an altar Christus, another Christ. Um, on the ground in front of him is a corpse, contorted, the spine twisted, arms and legs sprawled in opposite directions. And I'll give you, yeah, there's a close-up of that. Um, his grotesque, here, his grotesque face looks as though, looks at us though obscured um, eyes as blood and brains kind of ooze out of his skull. Um, yeah, so it's pretty graphic and, and sort of, you know, this, this stuff pulls around his head. Seconds ago, this man was alive. Further off to our hero's left, other men doubled over and on their knees are similarly um, secured to wooden stakes. I'll go back to the, the full composition. So here you can sort of see those other figures. Um, to his right, we see the cause of the carnage. A neat line of soldiers um, aim rifles at the men, the muzzle of their weapons disappearing behind our hero's hips. But the rest of the gun is not left to our imagination. Suddenly, as in such an obvious position that we wonder how we did not see it before, the barrel of three rifles appears from the right edge of the pitcher. So it is kind of, you don't notice it at first, so it is kind of... Um, off-putting and a little disturbing when you do finally realize it's there and it's aimed at our um, our Christ-like hero. Not only is he about to die, but his executioners are everywhere. As the caption of the picture tells us, um, and it's um, Inohai Remedio, and there's nothing to be done. So Goya created his Disasters of War series using a technique of etching and dry point um, called Aquatint. Um, so like Rembrandt, um, you know, we, we went over the etching process that he used. We're going to talk a little bit about the technique that Goya used. Um, Goya was able to use this technique to create um, nuances of shade, of light, and dark that captured the, the powerful emotional intensity 
of this horrific scene in the disasters of war. So again, you know, remember romanticism, you know, use these sort of um, paintings inspired by um, current events. Um, and again, you know, this colorito technique where, you know, they were inspired by the loose brushwork and sort of expressive emotional content of the piece. And so this sort of aqua tint technique would have made would have been a good technique to enhance those um, ideas. Um, the first step was to etch the plate. This was done by covering a copper plate with wax and then scratching lines into the wax with a stylus, very very similar to what Rembrandt did. A stylus is a sharp needle-like implement, um, thus exposed the metal. The plate was then placed in an acid bath. The acid bit into the metal where it was exposed. The rest of the plate was protected by the wax. Next, the acid was washed from the plate and the plate was heated so the wax softened and could be wiped away. The plate then had soft, even recessed lines etched by the acid where Goya had drawn into the wax. So very similar um, to Rembrandt. The next step, the dry point, created lines by a different method. Here, Goya scratched directly into the surface of the plate with the stylus. This resulted in a less even line since each scratch left a small ragged ridge on either side of the line. Um, these um, minute ridges um, catch the ink and create a soft distinctive line when printed. So it's, a, it's instead of being a, a smooth line, it's kind of rough and, and sort of, um, it kind of bleeds a little bit. However, because um, these ridges are delicate, and are um, crushed by repeatedly being run through a press, um, the earliest prints in a series are generally more highly valued. Finally, the artist inked the plate and wiped away any excess so that ink remained only in the areas um, where the acid bit into the metal or when the stylus had scratched the surface. The plate and moist paper were then placed atop one another and run through the press. The paper now, the paper now a print, drew the ink from the metal and became a mirror of the plate. So there you have it, aquatint. Um, the first group of prints to which um, I no I remedio, there's nothing to be done, belongs um, that the, it belongs to that series, shows the sobering consequences of conflict between French troops and Spanish civilians. The second group documents the effects of a famine that hit Spain in 1811 through 1812 at the end of the French rule. The final set of pictures depicts the um, disappointment and demoralization of the Spanish rebels who, after finally defeating the French, found that their reinstated monarchy would not accept any political reforms. Although they had expelled Bonaparte, the throne of Spain was still occupied by a tyrant, and this time they had fought um, to put him there. Although, um, and there's nothing to be done, may have crystallized um, the theme of disasters of war, it was not one of his most gruesome um, series. Um, this honor may belong to the print um, Esto Espero, This is the Worst, which captures the real-life massacre of Spanish civilians by the French army in 1808. In this um, very gory image, Goya copies a famous Hellenistic Greek fragment, the Belvedere Torso, which you see to your left, to create the body um, of the dead victim. Like the ancient fragment, he is armless, but this is because the French have mutilated his body, which is impaled on a tree through his anus and shoulder. So again, pretty graphic. As in there is nothing to be done, the corpse faces the corpse face stares out um, to the viewer who must confront his own culpability in allowing this massacre this massacre to take place. There is nothing to be done can also be compared to the plate. No se puede mira, one cannot look, um, here's that plate, um, in which the same faceless line of executioners point their weapons at a group of women and men who are about to die. So this is probably one of the more famous works by Goya, um, the 3rd of May, you perhaps have probably seen it. Um, so the disasters of war was not the last time that Goya would take on the subject of the horrors of the Peninsula um, War in 1814. Um, after completing the disasters of war, Goya created his masterpiece, the 3rd of May, 1808, which portrayed um, the ramifications of the initial uprising of the Spanish against the French. 
Right after Napoleon's takeover, sometimes called the first modern painting, it resembles um, its resemblance to Eno I Remedio is undeniable. In this painting, a Christ-like figure stands in front of a firing squad waiting to die. This line of soldiers is nearly identical to the murderers in the Aquatint um, series that we looked at before. In the 3rd of May, 1808, the number of assassins and victims is countless, indicating once again that there is nothing to be done. Although it is impossible to say whether the print or the painting came first, the repetition of the imagery is evidence that this theme, the cruelty of one group of people towards another, was a preoccupation um, for the artist, whose imagery would become even darker as he became older. And here's a, a full composition of it. Um, the painting has a sort of immediacy of photojournalism. Um, Goya visits um, the scene. He visited the scene where the event took place and made sketches. Um, yet, you know, he's making a departure from realism by, by painting it and also painting it in this um, very loose um, colorito technique. But it, it, gives a, it gives the event um, that he's portraying um, a, a kind of power, I think. Um, he lit the nocturnal scene with the lamp on the ground, casting this kind of garish light. In the rear, the church is dark. Again, that can be very symbolic that perhaps, um, you know, the light of humanity has been extinguished. I read that somewhere. I didn't come up with that on my own. But it makes sense. Um, and um, we see bloody carcasses that project um, toward the viewer into our space. And this line of victims, you know, again, gets sort of cut off. It goes off the frame. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's similar, you know, he very much, you know, as a painter, you know, really does pay homage to Velasquez um, in terms of these sort of compositional techniques that he uses. Um, the immediate victims in the center are the center of, um, the immediate victims in the center are the center of interest. Um, we have a white shirt man throwing wide his arms, very similar to the Aquatint series, um, in a very defiant but helpless gesture. Um, again, this recalls a, a, a crucified Christ figure. Also, the use of these sort of acid colors and this sort of acid color har um, harmony um, under, you know, these kind of greens and yellows, and they're sort of, you know, kind of washed out. Um, underscores the event's horror and violence. Um, Goya also contrasts the victim's faces and their sort of despairing gestures with the faceless um, sort of, you know, um, robot-like figures of the, of the firing squad, where, where here you see humanity and sort of this, you know, this horror of, of you know, humanity, um, you know, being you know, being massacred, and then here it's just such a contrast. They're, you know, lined up evenly. They're, you know, they're very um, posed and formal, and you can't see their faces. So it really is quite um, an interesting tension. Um, and that's one of the characteristics that we talked about with romanticism, the sort of tension between beautiful and ugly and being repulsed and attracted at the same time. So... In your in the top left hand corner, Goya's um, Disaster War series. This is the the actual picture that you're really responsible for. I have no oops, I have no idea why the AP College Board did not use um, the third of May as the required work. Um, but I, you know, it's such an important painting that I want you guys to know it. And again, I have a feeling that they might maybe perhaps throw this at you. Again, I'm I'm not really sure. Um, how the test, you know, I know the format of the test, but I, I, I don't know since they've changed the curriculum, um, you know, if they will show you works. I mean, I know they will. They'll, they'll show you works or and try to get you to attribute them based on, you know, the works that you have learned about. So this might pop up. So it is important that you know about it. And I will use this to contrast other works later when we um, look at more um, modern contemporary art. So, Goya's Disaster of War series was not printed until 35 years after the artist's death, when it was finally safe for the artist's um, political views to be known. 
The images remain shocking today and even influence the novel of the famous American author Ernest Hemingway, For Whom the Bell Tolls, a book about the violence and inhumanity in the Spanish Civil War. Hemingway shared Goya's belief expressed in the disasters of war that war, even if justified, brings out um, the inhumanity in man and causes us to act like beasts. And for both artists, the consumer who examines the dismembered corpses of the Aquatents and Goya's series, or reads the gruesome descriptions of murder described by Hemingway, and does nothing to stop the assassin, is complicit in the violence with the murderer as well. So I started off the very beginning of our segment, part one, um, talking about the work and reviewing the work of um, the neoclassical painting by David, the Oath, of, the Oath of Horatio. And I think it's a good one to compare and contrast with Goya's The Third of May. Um, definitely you can see some similarities and um, obviously there's some very distinct differences as well. Um, when we look at um, Francisco's Goya, The Third of May, um, and compare it to David's, we see that, you know, one of the things that's different is that David mined or took a story um, from from ancient um, Rome and Greece that's more than 2,500 years old. Um, remember, one of the characteristics of um, Romanticism was pulling events or, you know, depicting events from the headlines, these current events. So Goya instead completes... Um, a history painting, um, but he does it from the recent past. Um, so the chronological immediacy only increases um, the, the sort of emotional quality of Goya's painting. Um, I want you to look at it on your own and see if you can make some other comparisons and contrasts. So I'll give you a moment to do that. So I paused it and hopefully you paused it so you could take the time to do it. Um, but some things to um, contrast, um, the brushwork, remember with David, um, it was very smooth and he was a, a, a disagonal, a linear artist. Um, Goya is an expressive, you know, he incorporates expressive and loose brushwork, so he is um, more along the lines of the colorito technique where they built up color. Um, there's also this um, contrast where David is promoting the rational and, and, and really um, um, expressing that where Goya's painting is definitely more emotional. And, but there are some similarities, I think, definitely with the composition. You know, both incorporate these sort of, you know, the similar stance of the soldiers um, is something I think that they, they do have in common. So anyway, that concludes um, our segment on early 19th century art. Um, we'll be um, moving on to other isms like realism and impressionism in our next segments. Um, oh, before we do that, though, we do have to look at early American art. My bad. So we're going to look at that, and then we'll look at those other two. And as always, try to review the Khan Academy videos that I have posted for you um, along with your PowerPoint and lecture notes.